everyone. Today we're going to talk about art in the Middle Ages, and this goes along with quest six in our Middle Ages web quest. Three big things we're going to talk about. There are tons we could get into detail about. We focus on three. Those include cathedrals, which is this picture here, stained glass in the middle, and illuminated manuscripts on the right. So let's start with the first one, which is cathedrals. You can see a picture of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, France, which still stands today. There are a lot of different features here that we're going to talk about. We've also got a picture of the Canterbury Cathedral in England, very similar to Notre Dame, both inside and out. So let's talk about a few things with cathedrals. First thing we want to talk about is the number of churches that were built during the Middle Ages. You guys all know that you live on a manor or your character lives on a manor and that's really important because on every manor there would have been a church but the biggest ones would have been the cathedrals and those are the ones that we need to talk about today so why were cathedrals built generally they were built to honor God they were built to hold the people um, that needed to be held in a church service but also the better the bigger the more expensive you made your cathedral the more it looked like you were worshiping God and that was one of their big purposes the interesting thing is that the construction of a cathedral could have taken up to 200 years to finish so the person that eventually finished it wouldn't have even been the same person that came up with the design in the first place what is the role of the cathedral in the Middle Ages? They were not only a place of worship, but they were just the center of daily life. Um, obviously, the clergy, anyone involved with the church, would spend a lot of time there. The nobility, the nobles, and the knights of the era, as well as the kings and queens, would have spent time there. And even the peasants. Everyone played an important role in the church, even the peasants, though they were the lower class. Some responsibilities of each class are listed right here. The clergy was responsible for putting the labor and finances together, so they had to come up with the fundraising to actually build the cathedral. The nobility was responsible for contributing that money, and the peasants were responsible for building it. So some of the peasants would have had a job, you know, especially if they were a master carpenter or something along those lines, they would have had a job building the cathedrals. But it did belong to everyone. That's a really important thing from the Middle Ages, that... The cathedral belonged to everyone, no matter what class you were. Um, it was a space that anyone could go to. Um, it was the town's symbol to the world to show that it, it had a strength of faith. Now, the important thing about cathedrals also is that they tell a story. And there's a lot of symbolism in cathedrals. And we're going to go into a little detail about each of these. You've got architecture, stained glass, sculptures. There was also... Um, just the different ways that things were built, the columns and the arches, tons of stuff that represents a cathedral. And they were also represented in the time period and the location. So the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris is going to look a little different than the Canterbury Cathedral in England. Let's get into some of that detail of symbolism. So all cathedrals are normally in the shape of a cross, and there's a picture coming up on the next slide of that. The construction always began at the east end, even though the west end was the most important. The west end symbolized the gate to heaven, so it was usually the one that was de decorated the more, most elaborate. And you can see that by looking here, you can see that the west end is going to be decorated a lot more than the east end. They were built very tall. We've talked about this a lot, both on the inside as in that the ceilings were you know, it wasn't like it had multiple floors in the big sanctuary area. The taller it was, the closer people felt to heaven. And that's why the, the outside was also built as tall, because the top of the peaks needed to be as close as they could to the heavens. They were also built on hills a lot of the time in order to kind of, you know, be the dominating thing in the area. And that was really important as well. So here's that picture of Notre Dame Cathedral from the air. And you can see that this cathedral is in the shape of a cross, which is pretty cool. I mean, they, you know, we're going to watch a video in a minute that has the designs of the cross and how they did that. And um, obviously, that's an easy way to represent their faith. But, it, you know, really, you don't get this view a lot. Even, you know, none of the peasants or anything would have had this view back then. So it was really only meant for God to see. Let's go ahead and move on to stained glass. Two pieces of stained glass here, both of them telling stories, which is something we've talked about a lot with stained glass. You can see that this story goes in this order here. 
and goes all the way to the bottom. And then over here, this one goes in a clockwise formation and tells the story as well. So stained glass in the Middle Ages is a very important thing. This is really when it starts to become very common. It was used um, for pieces of colored glass. You know, it was joined together by strips of lead to form a picture. And most of the time, we see stained glass in windows. And the reason for that is when the sun passes through it, it really makes it look a lot cooler. It makes the, the room light up in color, and it, it just makes the glass look a lot better. So usually it's used for windows. And it was not only beautiful, but it also had an educational purpose. Remember that most people in the Middle Ages couldn't read. So the cathedral was the center of learning during that time period. And there were very few books, so most people had to read through these stories, these pictures, rather than through words. Also, the first designs of stained glass windows were a lot from the Bible. That's what they, you know, how they played a role in the church, and they really did teach people a lot about their religious beliefs. Not only were they in churches, though, eventually a lot of the nobles would pay for windows to be made of kings and saints, but not just that, they would also make them all themselves if they could afford it. And the first way that they actually used this during the Middle Ages was through the ashes of trees to create and then combining with sand to create the colored the colored glass they would draw a picture on like a big white board and then they would lay the pieces down um, the colored glass pieces down and then use hot iron to cut out these these shapes so it's not like they would pour the glass into the mold already they would cut the glass based on the shape that they needed and then they would cut the strips of lead to fit between and that's how it became a design so our last one we're going to talk about are the illuminated manuscripts. And these are the front pictures here. They were a lot of pictures and not a lot of words. And again, the reason for that is the lack of people being able to read in the Middle Ages. So illuminated manuscript, the definition is a handwritten book decorated with gold or silver, lots of colors, elaborate designs and paintings to give the impression that the page was illuminated or that it was lit up. Before books were printed mechanically, and we're going to talk about this in our next quest, Science and Technology, all of the text had to be written by hand, which obviously is very time consuming. It's very costly, so they just didn't have a lot of books. But monks were the ones that really spent the most time doing this, making these books. They were the most educated, but that also meant that monks dedicated their life to writing down and copying these religious texts. That meant that they were used for religious purposes. So that's how illuminated manuscripts go all the way back to the Catholic Church at this time because everything was so related. Um, many of the manuscripts were embellished with fancy letters, with gold and silver, and you can see that in these pictures that, you know, all these writings are made out of bright, bright colors, golds and silvers and reds, really rich colors that would stand out. And they've lasted this long. We're going to look at a video, um, or you're going to have the opportunity to look at a video that shows the Book of Kells, which is one of the oldest books to ever be found. It's sitting in Dublin, Ireland right now at Trinity University and it's under glass. You can't touch it or anything like that, but it's very old. But all the colors really still stand out because they used such detail and time to make these things, to create these objects. Um, let's move on to creating the manuscripts, how they do that. Many of them were written in ink or on parchment or vellum. The best quality was called vellum, which was made by brushing calf skin they had to like stretch it and dry out calf skin and that's what they wrote on um so it wasn't paper like you're used to writing on it was actually almost like a leather and the text was first written by a scribe by a person and then they would take this gold leaf and that's how they would get the painting process done by an illuminator which is the person who would do, who would do the painting and then the application of color was added following like this really big plan design so somebody wouldn't just free for all paint this it would really take a lot of skill and a lot of time to get it planned and done correctly last but not least why are they significant why are we talking about them well they were a huge important part of society back then they represented all the religious and social and artistic beliefs of the time if we find and look at manuscripts now we really see a lot of what happened in the middle ages but due to the expense of them they really served as status symbols only the most popular and most wealthy people who owned land back then would own these manuscripts so they really are 
pretty few and far between. If you were to travel to museums today, these wouldn't be in a lot of places because they just wouldn't last that long unless they were taken care of. A lot of the themes in the manuscripts were not just religion, but also art and characters. So the Canterbury Tales would have been written using um, an illuminated manuscript at first, and then it was turned into text later on. And last but not least, the primary function of the decoration was to pay a tribute to the subject of the book. So the better the art in the book, the better the content of the book. If the art in the book wasn't done very well, then they probably wouldn't have thought very highly of the, of the material that the book was even talking about. Hopefully you've learned a lot about the three things we just covered, which again are cathedrals, stained glass, and illuminated manuscripts. Now I do want to go ahead and show you a quick video. It's in the last slide, so you can go back to it anytime you'd like. This one's here. We're going to watch this one on the Chartreuse Cathedral. And this is the Book of Kells. We're not going to watch that one today, but hopefully you take time to do that on your own because it's also very interesting. The church was extremely powerful. Uh, it was powerful in regard to belief. It was powerful in regard to political control. Dr. Amy Livingston of Wittenberg University, Ohio. Yes, she's one of my college professors. Go, Dr. Livingstone! Believes that politics was at the heart of Chartres' creation. The bishops uh, were very much a part of the political structure of medieval Europe. With such high stakes, Bishop Renaud knows the choice of architect or master builder is crucial. The search for the right person could take years. Yet within weeks of the fire, before the search even gets underway, an architect who claims he can build the new cathedral steps forward. Today his name is shrouded in mystery. There's no record of who this person was, so we don't know how he was found, where he came from, we don't really know anything about him. Journalist and author Dr. Philip Ball is intrigued by this enigmatic architect. It seems clear that he must have been someone who had a lot of experience, but beyond that, we know nothing. But he must have impressed Renault, as he is appointed master builder of the new Chartres Cathedral. It's a daunting challenge. The old cathedral was long and narrow. But a common shape is not enough for Bishop Bernard. He wants his new cathedral to be the cutting edge of its day. He transforms the rectangle to a cross. A cross large enough to be seen by God in heaven. It's an ambitious vision, but at its heart are three simple shapes. The builder would use simple geometric shapes for the cathedral's design. For Professor Michael Davis of Mount Holyoke College, such shapes were crucial to medieval architecture. These would be the circle, the square, and the equilateral triangle. These shapes were included in every aspect of the cathedral's design. To the medieval mind, the circle, square, and triangle were uniquely harmonious, reflecting man's desire to be at one with the divine spirit. The circle is a sacred symbol of purity. Outside a circle, can be drawn a perfect square. By diagonally bisecting the perfect square, we arrive at four triangles. Every single element of the design uses derivatives of these three shapes. As always, if you have questions, make sure you ask. 
Have a good day.